Crew Resource Management, better known as CRM, sparked its early beginnings from the field of human factors. One of the most practical working definitions of human factors comes from the International Civil Aviation Organization, IKO. It states, human factors is about people. It is about people in their working and living environment, and it's about their relationship with equipment, procedures, and the environment. Just as importantly, it is about their relationships with other people. Its two objectives can be seen as safety and efficiency. On December 29, 1972, a Lockheed L-1011 crashed into the Florida Everglades, killing 99 people on board. The cause of the crash was attributed to three crew members being fixated on the problem of a burnt out light bulb. Tower Eastern 401, looks like we're gonna have to circle. We don't have a light on our nose gear yet. Eastern 401 Heavy, roger. Pull up, climb straight ahead to 2000. Go back to approach control, 128.6. Okay, up to 2000, 128.6. Okay, autopilot coming up. I'll see if we can get that light on. Go down there and see if that nose gear is down. I'll check it out. We're still at 2,000 here, right? Hey, what's happening here? The 1970s were noted for having a significant number of major aviation accidents involving highly professional flight crews. As a result, this decade marked the implementation of crew resource management. In 1972, a multidisciplinary approach was taken, bringing about the human factors shell model. The shell model helps define any productive process by examining the interactions and relationships of all the vital components. Its name is derived from the initial letters of its four components. The first component, S, represents software. In an aviation environment, software is reflected in the regulations, manuals, and the standard operating procedures by which a crew operates. The second component in the shell model is H, or hardware. Hardware is comprised of the actual cockpit, the layout of flight controls, seat design, and computer systems. The third component in the shell model is E, representing the environment. The environment embodies both internal cabin and external aircraft areas. Elements such as temperature, noise, vibration, weather, terrain, landing and approach all play a part of the environment component. The last and fourth component of the shell model is L, pertaining to liveware. Liveware represents the different individuals at work in an aviation environment. Liveware is the pilots, flight crew, air traffic control, maintenance personnel, ground crew, and people working in the en route centers. As demonstrated, there are multiple layers within this initial shell model, and the layering of these interacting forces can become quite complex. The shell model was one of the first coordinated efforts to explore the various relationships at work in the aviation process. As aviation continued to evolve and become more sophisticated, the shell model began to reflect a more complex process with layering methods in an aviation environment. For instance, as aircraft technology and software improved, checklists expanded, extensive safety procedures were required, more regulations were necessary, and the pilots became further immersed in multitask efforts. 
Software and checklists continued to escalate due to the increased load of hardware in the cockpit. Flight deck technology evolved into more complex instruments and advanced displays. As engineers tested new aircraft designs in an effort to accommodate more passengers, the liveware component of the shell model became further embedded in safety critical processes. In 1974, Frank Bird, an industrial safety pioneer, endorsed the domino theory, correlating that a series of errors can lead to a mishap. Like dominoes falling, one sequentially leads to another until the final piece falls. The domino theory implies that if any one domino is removed from the sequence and is strong enough to withstand impact, the expected result of other dominoes falling is not likely to happen. In 1990, British psychologist James Reason expanded and updated the domino theory of error, calling it the Swiss cheese model. Reason was able to categorize active and latent failures that can occur and interact in any given situation. Active failures represent actions that cause the failure, whereas latent failures contribute indirectly to errors in the chain of command. While hopefully there are several safeguards in place to protect situations from occurring, like Swiss cheese, there are holes in even the best laid plans. However, if the holes become aligned, indicating a breakdown in safeguards, an accident is likely to result. While applying concepts of the Swiss cheese model, Dr. Scott Chappelle and Dr. Douglas Wigman designed the human factors analysis and classification system known as HVACs. The HVAC system examines how aviation problems are developed, whether the issues are skill-based, perceptual, or can be attributed to organizational factors. HVACs helps gain insight into how and why human errors occur in aviation. Using a four-tiered approach to demonstrate how accidents occur, these tiers provide guidance of how to potentially improve human performance. The top tier represents organizational factors and then flows down to the next tier of unsafe supervision. The next tier symbolizes preconditions for unsafe acts. Subsequently, the last or bottom tier is an unsafe act which ultimately results in an accident or injury. Simply put, Crew resource management represents yet another layered tier under the preconditions for unsafe acts. Being able to recognize active and latent conditions helps in the prevention of an accident. By utilizing an open communication process, conducting prioritizations and managing the workload effectively, CRM reinforces the importance of accident prevention. Think about what aviation was like over a century ago. What kind of paperwork and checklist did the Wright brothers use? How much hardware were they working with in the cockpit? We can visibly see the crew size and acknowledge that the sand dunes of Kitty Hawk set the stage for their environment. In contrast, let's look at the military's B-52 Stratofortress. Operating from eight engines in a crew of six, the maintenance debrief can last anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours depending upon system issues and problems. What kind of differences in hardware and software exist among these decades of aviation? As technologies persist in generating complexities in the cockpit, it is easy for one to trace how workload management continues to expand in different aviation environments. Upon seeing the DC-3 for the first time, General Billy Mitchell said, Too many gadgets. Man can't fly in rough conditions and watch all those gauges. Through the use of communications, prioritizations, and workload management, the backbone of crew resource management was created. The more sophisticated the machinery, the more time investment required. When examining aviation automation and hardware, it's apparent that systems have been consolidated making dials easier to read. Nevertheless, a substantial amount of information flows through the hardware, requiring an inordinate amount of training for the user. As a byproduct of the hardware process, software procedures are continually revisited. Originally, the concept of cockpit resource management consisted of studying pilots on the flight deck. 
Using the liveware component, the concept of crew later increased to incorporate operational areas that affect the flight profile. For example, flight attendants, maintenance personnel, ground crew, dispatchers, and air traffic control personnel are vital. While there are many incidents that led to the study of CRM in the 1970s, for purposes of this training, only a few examples will be discussed. A major event held in 1979 was the NASA Industrial Workshop. This meeting was considered to be the foundation of aviation psychology and cockpit resource management. Several major airlines were represented at this summit. Vital industry gurus contributed to the synergistic exchange, including Lauber, Cooper, and Foshi. It was from such a gathering that United Airlines started their own practice of command, leadership, and resource management known as CLR. This was the first time that people of diverse occupational backgrounds were brought together in the interest of aircraft safety. Ideas were shared among psychologists, flight surgeons, academians, and airline pilots. While the workshop opened dialogue among these varying groups, the event provoked suspicions among air crews, concerned that too many specialists were getting into their business, potentially resulting in losing control of the cockpit. Over time, the air crews began to realize that they were not losing control of the cockpit, rather they were learning how to manage the systems and workload more efficiently. Washington Approach, Medical 452, we have the airport insight. There are many underlying concepts towards accident prevention. Crew resource management is manifested by three inherent factors. Communications, setting priorities, and workload management. Admittedly, these factors can affect any kind of business or corporation, but what sets CRM apart from other lines of business are the added factors of time and death. Incidentally, emergency and operating rooms, as well as nuclear reactor control facilities, share time and death factors with the aviation environment. The goal of CRM training is to blend technical and human skills to support safe and efficient aviation operations. 